Major Lindsay and Africa presents Bouncing Back, conversations about resilience for lawyers. Welcome to Bouncing Back, Resilience for Lawyers. This podcast is brought to you by Major, Lindsay, and Africa, the global leader in legal search and consulting. I'm your host, Rebecca Glatzer. I'm a partner in the associate practice group at Major, Lindsay, and Africa. In this podcast, I'll speak to successful professionals about the hiccups, bumps, bruises, and setbacks they've experienced in their careers and personal lives, and how they ultimately bounce back from those experiences to thrive. Today, my guest is Marla Butler. Marla is a member of the executive committee of Thompson Hine and former partner in charge of the firm's Atlanta office. She represents clients in the medical, semiconductor, power, networking, and other high-tech industries in high-stakes commercial litigations, arbitrations, and trials. She helps clients proactively take on commercial threats, monetize their patent assets, and defend against lawsuits that threaten their businesses. Among other recognitions, Marla has been selected for inclusion in the Best Lawyers of America for Commercial Litigation and Litigation Intellectual Property. She's been named the Best Lawyers 2025 Litigation Intellectual Property Lawyer of the Year for Atlanta and recognized as a litigation star by Benchmark Litigation. She was selected to the Georgia Super Lawyers list, named by IAM 1000, the world's leading patent practitioners, as a recommended individual for litigation and licensing, named one of the top 250 women in IP by managing intellectual property, and recognized by Law 360 as a minority power broker. She was also selected for inclusion in Lawyers of Colors, Nation's Best in 2020. A leader in the Atlanta area and in professional litigation circles, Marla frequently provides pro bono representation. In one of her most significant recent matters, she worked with Lambda Legal to represent an incarcerated transgender woman who was denied medically necessary treatment for gender dysphoria, obtaining a ruling believed to be the first to find that freeze frame policies, blanket bans on providing hormone treatment to transgender individuals who were not receiving such treatment prior to incarceration are unconstitutional. Active in the community, Marla is currently on the boards of the National LGBTQ Plus Bar Association and of the LGBTQ Plus Division of the National Bar Association. She is a former board member of Lambda Legal. Marla earned her BA degree from Cleveland State University and her JD from Florida State University. Marla, thank you for being my guest today. I'm happy to be here, Rebecca. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Well, in a prior conversation that we had, um, you mentioned that earlier in your career, you were actually devastated the first time you lost a big case. Can you share what happened? Sure. Um, so, you know, when I went to law school, um, it was with the goal of being a litigator. I, I, I think, I don't know that I knew that there was any other type of lawyer besides a litigator at that point. I didn't have, you know, lawyers in my in my family, in my life. And so to me, being a lawyer was synonymous with being a litigator and a trial lawyer. And so, um, you know, while I consider myself a trial lawyer, I, I, I'm not one of these people that has tried dozens and dozens of cases, but I've tried I've tried a few cases and. Early in my career, I got opportunities as a first year associate, third year associate, fourth year associate to try cases before juries with pretty good success. Um, And it's an area, courtroom is a space where I feel very comfortable and enjoy being. Um, I was a junior partner. Um, I think it was summer or spring of 2008. And I had been brought on to a team at my prior firm that was going to try a patent litigation case. So I had not been involved in the workup of that case. But when it became clear that the case was going to go to trial, I was asked to join the team. I did. Um, And, you know, for anybody that's been to trial, you know that for those days or weeks or sometimes months that you're in trial, you're living and breathing trial. You're 
going to bed thinking about trial, you're waking up thinking about trial, um, and it, it's all consuming. And this was no different. I was, you know, completely consumed in this trial. I was committed um, to um, our client's position. I was committed to winning. And, uh, you know, I took a, a fairly significant role in the trial and the jury came back and we lost. <laughs> and I just remember um, like feeling devastated uh, and, you know, probably for weeks, I just thought and rethought what we should have done differently, what we should have done better. Um, and it was a really kind of down moment. Now, I'll tell you before I get to the rest of that story that I've lost trial since. And one of the lessons that I learned is that the, the hardest trial to lose is your first one. <laughs> and if you try enough <laughs> cases, you, you realize that, you know, sometimes you lose trials. And that's when the case only cases that go to trial are the close ones. Right. So sometimes you right. lose trials. And so it, it doesn't sting like that anymore. But but that particular instance stung. Absolutely. And it sounds like um, having ever lost before, it, it was like, you know, what do I do with these feelings and how do I recover from this? I have a question for you. I, I was curious how the client responded, you know, if they, if this was primarily you beating yourself up or were you getting flack from your colleagues and, and you know, the, the, the client who you were representing as well? Yeah, no, the, the client knew that it was a tough case. Um, and the client knew that, you know, there was a really good chance that the client would not win. Um, I, you know, I think what happens when you are kind of fully immersed in something like that, and, and you're the advocate, you become convinced that you can win. And, you know, sometimes the merits just aren't strong enough for you to win, no matter how well, you know, you communicate the evidence to the jury and communicate your arguments to a jury. And so the client was not surprised by the loss. The client was not upset with our team. Um, you know, and I may have been the person on our team that took it the hardest. I think, um, you know, it, it was not, It if you take a few steps back and look at the reality of the situation, it, it was not completely surprising that we lost. Yes. Yes, um, but it's like so that's the first time for everything. So, how did you kind of get yourself out of that funk? Right, it sounds like it went on for a few weeks, and I, I'm curious. You know, it sounds like the, you're like me. You ruminate over things that you feel like you did wrong or mistakes. Um, but, but how were you able to kind of move on to the next thing that was in front of you? Yep, I mean, so you know, if we don't have um, other things to occupy our minds, then we can fill that space in our minds with those ruminations of what we should or shouldn't have done differently. Um, but I was able to, after a few weeks, to, things got busy, right? And I and I just didn't have a lot of capacity to continue to beat myself up over, over that loss. And so basically I got over it by diving back into work. Um, yes. and, you know, yes. and, and committing to, to other matters and, and, and other clients. Right. Sort of like it's time to move on. Well, you also mentioned, um, in our previous conversation, Marla, that interestingly enough, that loss ended up being sort of career changing for you. Can you share a little bit about that? Sure. Um, and career changing in a positive way. And I, I have started sharing, this story with younger attorneys, I call it my my silver lining story, because um, you know we we lost that case to um, a big firm that was on the other side. That that big firm also had um, you know had another client that was a a huge at that time, oh probably Fortune from the top ten Fortune ten company maybe Fortune 5 even. Um, and that firm, so our opposing firm, was meeting with this Fortune 5, Fortune 10 company because that company was a, another client of, of the firm. And as the story came to me, was bragging a bit about having won that trial 
against my former firm. But in the process of bragging about winning that trial against my other firm, also said to the in-house lawyer at this big company, you know, but there was this lawyer that came in kind of, you know, as trial was approaching. And when things got started at trial, we were actually really concerned that we were going to lose. And I think it was kind of an unintended by this opposing counsel, an unintended compliment about my performance at trial. And the the in-house lawyer that he was talking to just kind of, you know, just made a note, mental note, and um, shortly after reached out to me. Um, And this is now uh, a client that I, you know, developed slowly over a few years, um, got first kind of significant litigation matter for this client around 2010, 2011, um, and is now by far my most significant client. It's a it's a client that um, I'm loyal to, that has shown a lot of loyalty to me, that I've built a significant practice with. And it's a client that when I was at my last firm and I wanted to change, I was at that firm for 22 years. And for many reasons, I was ready to move on. It was the client that allowed me to do that because, you know, when you're 22 years into practice and you want to make a move to another firm as a partner, one of the first questions is what's your book of business? And it's a lot harder to change firms you know, into a good position with good compensation if you don't have a book of business. Um, I was able to, you know, as I'm looking at other firms and considering other firms, I was able to say I've got this huge client. And it allowed me to, from the firms that I was speaking with, to pick the firm that I wanted to join. Um, it's, It's a client relationship that allowed me to make that move comfortably. And it's a client relationship that I've continued to grow at at my current firm. That's phenomenal. I love that. I love that story. And I'm curious. I, I mean, I'm I've I've gotten a few takeaways from from what you said, but I'm curious for you, Marla. What you know? What do you think of the lessons uh, that you learned looking back from that experience? Absolutely. So, you know, the the biggest lesson is just always be good at your craft. Um, No matter the situation, no matter what the ultimate outcome might be, just work to be very good at what you do. You know, it is, um, we, we are going to lose cases. We're going to have deals that go bad. Um, but there are always other people in, you know, that are involved in those cases and those deals. And no matter what, you've got to show up as your best. I, I have a had another trial um, uh, about a year or so after the one I just described. And it was, a, you know, it was that was a case that we won. We didn't want to win as much as we hope we would, but we, we generally won it. And the opposing lawyer is now a referral source for me. You know, it is just we 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 it, as lawyers and especially law firm lawyers, we are part of a network, and you know the other side is part of your network, right? And so how you interact with them, um, performing at your best, all of that can lead to good things indirectly. In, in ways that you wouldn't necessarily expect. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great life lesson. Uh, two things, two two great life lessons for our listening audience and for, you know, more junior and for these who are listening to this podcast is, number one, you never know who's watching. <laughs> so that's right. Perform at your best, you know, at all times, because you don't know what kinds of opportunities are going to come from, you know, your performance. Um, I tell people this all the time, you know, you really want to make sure that you're not 
Um, you know, if you're leaving a firm, you don't want to like burn a bridge on your way out because you don't know if the person that you're speaking to is going to maybe go to another firm where you have an opportunity and want to take you with or go in-house and you're interviewing for the in-house job and you're like, yep. oh, this is something I knew from my life. The last firm, the, the legal world is a very small one. And I swear it gets smaller and smaller the, the farther out you are from graduation. Um, and then I think, too, you know, this idea that, um, you know, even folks on the other side can be referral sources or, you know, provide opportunities because they see that you've done a good, um, you know, a good job. I've had candidates who've gone to interviews, didn't get the interview, but were asked by a partner to sit on a panel with them or write an article with them or do other things. And so, um, you know, it's something to keep in mind is to, and to also like treat, treat people well, um, you know, no matter what, with respect. Um, and that sort of thing. So I, I think those are great lessons um, that have clearly served you well, um, you know, since since that point in time. Well, I want to segue a little bit, Marla. Um, you know, obviously the theme of this podcast is resilience, and you cannot be a lawyer, particularly a litigator, <laughs> without being resilient. Uh, you know, as you mentioned previously, you, you know, you lost that case, which you found de- devastating stating, and then subsequently lost other cases. Yeah. Not necessarily through any fault of your own. It's just, you know, maybe the facts were not good or the law was not on your side. Um, and I was curious um, where the strength or knowledge or help to get through these sort of difficult experiences comes from for you. Yeah, so um, at some point I realized something about myself that when I reflect on it, uh, it, I think, help explains why I have a tendency to kind of move past, you know, hardships or relatively quickly. Um, I was having a conversation with uh, a consultant that she's a consultant for um, law firms, and, and we were just kind of casually chatting and I was sharing some experiences that I'd had in just different contexts. And she said to me, um, she kind of paused and looked at me and she said, yeah, you just kind of let things roll off your back, don't you? And it was something I had not thought about, but it really, like it resonated. It was uh, it was a kind of a revelation of sorts, you know, self-revelation in the sense that um, I think I do, right? I, I think I I have a tendency. I, I'm a glass half full person. I am. Mm-hmm. I, I I I I just have a tendency to, for example, if someone says something that could be taken two ways, right? If it could be taken as offensive or it could be taken as you know complimentary but with maybe a little bit of ignorance mixed in (laughs) right um right i'm 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 more likely to just assume good intentions and take the compliment for what it is and disregard um you know, whatever component of ignorance might have been a part of what they said and assume that they just had good intentions. And um, and so my tendency has been to, even if there's a, a bump in the road, if there's a loss, right, that there's going to be another opportunity, that there's going to be another trial. You know, we lost this one, but we'll win the next one. We lost this one, but I think we're going to win the appeal. Right. And, and it's and it's but it's a tendency, I think, to to um, put things in perspective um, in the big scheme of my life and my career. You know, losing that trial honestly was not a big deal. Right. Um, it, and, and so I can put it in that kind of perspective and move on to the next thing that, you know, that may end up turning out much better. Yeah. I mean, I I think this is great life advice. It's great career advice. Um, I would hazard to guess as as one of the few um, 
you know, women of color who are a partner at a major AMLAW firm in the country. I mean, there aren't there aren't that many, um, you know, you, you know, it, who are in your good company. Um, also, um, you know, someone who identifies as LGBTQ. That is probably a good lawyer skill and probably also a good life skill <laughs> to be able to kind of grab onto the positivity in some of these comments um, and, and kind of push forward with that um, and not sort of get hung up on the ignorance or the naivete. A- absolutely. I mean, I, I tell, I've told young lawyers, just like practice it, like just make yourself do it. Because if, if every time you, you know, hear a remark or see something that doesn't quite feel right. If you spend a ton of energy processing that and um, just ruminating about whatever the ignorance is that's behind it, that's energy that, you know, your colleagues, your, for example, white male colleagues are spending improving the legal memo that they've been working on, right? You know, because they don't have to spend energy on that kind of thing as much as as much as you do. So like find ways to deliberately limit the amount of energy that you're spending on, I'll just say other people's ignorance and and, and fully recognizing that if somebody says or does something that um, you know that's that's not fair, that's not that's a stereotype, or you know that otherwise just demonstrates ignorance. That's their issue. It's not yours. Now you know, of course, we've always we always have to. It's always a line that we have to make sure is not crossed, right? Because I'm not saying I'm not suggesting that we just let things happen to us and we never address them and we kind of keep moving on. But I'm suggesting that we've got to pick our battles, right? We've got to figure out, you know, what, what is really worth me spending energy on, right? Is this, you know, lawyer in another office that made some off color remark? um, eh, Am I going to spend energy on that? Or, or am I going to spend energy on instead on, the lawyer that I work with that gave me an unfair evaluation because of some assumptions that he has about me, right? That the latter is the one that's going to have more of an impact on your career. The former is not. So spend your energy on the latter and just let the former roll off your back. And move along yeah. because because what happens is you know you you if you can successfully maneuver through those landmines then you end up being the person that's making the decisions about somebody's evaluation right you end up right. as the person that's in charge of the group or the office or you know whatever component of the organization. And you have fewer of these kind of, you know, instances of um, or these fewer circumstances that you've got to that you've got to maneuver through. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it sounds like to me you're encouraging, especially you, you, you younger folks who, again, have not arrived in their power yet. Right? That's, right. Their second That's right. That's right. Or whatever. They, or they're a brand new council level attorney at some company. Um, playing uh, chess, not checkers, right? You know, what's the long game here and what deserves my energy, my emotional energy, my physical energy, expending political capital perhaps to effectuate change and what absolutely does not and I need to just let it roll off my back, like you said. Exactly, because, I mean, it's a zero-sum game in the sense that we only have so much energy emotionally and otherwise Right. And so we have to be very selective about where we spend it and we have to spend it in ways that benefit us, but that don't stagnate us 
or set or send us backwards. Yeah, no, I that makes total sense. I mean, this is what we mean by privilege, right? It's like, you know, there are certain groups in the world that don't have to think about these things. And yep. there are other groups in the world that absolutely have to think about these things, especially if they have more than one, you know, minoritized identity. And it's like, you know, I, I need to know where my power lies and I need to know where my allies are and I need to know where I can move the needle and not. Otherwise, you're just exhausted all the time. I mean, if you, like you said, if you took every slide and internalized it or externalized yep. it. Yep, that's right. You wouldn't have time for the stuff that's going to get you where you want to go. Um, and I think I think that's that's sound advice, and that's in any any scenario, whether you're a woman, whether you're a black woman, whether you're an LGBTQ person, or have some constellation of identities that um, you know put you in the minority in your in your in your organization. Um, let me ask you this: Have you always been this way, Marla? Like, you know, it, it, is this sort of a need for you to kind of you know to pick and choose your battles and that sort of thing, or is it something that you learned along the way? Um, I, I'm not a hundred percent sure, uh, but I think it, I, I think it's learned and, you know, as I get older, so I turned 55 in January and as I, as I get older, I think as, you know, as, as, as folks tend to do, as they get older, you spend more time kind of reflecting on, on your life. And one of the things that occurred to me in the last several years was the influence that my mother had on my self-esteem. My mother and I had a very, um, I'll call it a rocky relationship uh, for yeah. basically all of my adult life. And I, you know, that was one of those things that in my mind, it was the rocky relationship. And it took me a long time to see kind of the positives of what you know she did for me or instilled in me right but but my mother had um she's and she's since passed away but she had a uh and I don't know if this was innate in her or not but this you know deep sense of confidence and just um you know a a, a, a unapologetic right to be in this world in whatever mm -hmm. capacity. And in ways she passed that down to me, right? I, I remember I told my kids the story. I thought that they would think it was funny. They were kind of mortified by it. But um, <laughs> uh, I, I remember being um, either five or six years old and I went to schools with um, almost all white classmates. In like second to eighth grade, I was the only black person in the entire school. And this this was, I was in either kindergarten or first grade. There were a few other black kids in the school, I think, but I don't even remember them, right? I just remember, you know, the sense of being kind of the only. And, um, and, the, the school that I was at was also school that my older brothers had gone to. And so the, and it was a Catholic school. And so the, um, the, the principal, the teachers, they knew my mother because my brothers had come through that school. So I was five or six years old and this, you know, long story short, this, another, one of my classmates hit me. She punched me in the stomach for kind of no apparent reason. And I, pushed her, you know, in response, like pushed her against the wall. And we were both sent to the principal's office. And when we walked into the principal's office and the principal said, you know, how can I help you girls? And she eventually admitted to hitting me. And when the principal turned to me to ask me, um, you know, what I did, I said, I hit her back because my mother told me that if anybody hits me, I can defend myself, right? I love and, it. And your little pit squeak, you're like, you're like in kindergarten. Yeah, exactly. I probably had pigtails, like the whole deal. My, you know, the plaid uniform with the white shirt and the blue vest, the Catholic school, oh, Catholic school it. uniform. 
And I yeah. did. And I, and I was, I mean, I just, it just was like, it wasn't like, I wasn't, I, I don't remember feeling like timid about saying it. Like it just was right. And, so, and I, you know, right. my mother told me somebody hits me, I hit him back like period. And I was excused. Right. Like that was it because like, because like I said, they knew my mother. <laughs> right. <laughs> and that, right. and that was, right. the, that was the end of that. I remember being um, in high school and I was um, with a group of girls and a couple of them had stolen somebody's purse and the school was going to punish me along with these other girls. And I remember my mother coming to the school and I went to a, a school in, in uh, suburbs of Cleveland, Orange High School. And, and so we're sitting in, in the principal's office and my mother wanted to understand why they were punishing me. And my mother said, my daughter is not Orange High School police, right? And, mm -hmm. you know, and it was just like, it's not her responsibility to, you know, she doesn't have an obligation to tell on other to report and, you know, that kind of thing. And I was excused. And so I think like that, that was kind of the environment that I grew up in that um, implicitly taught me to, like my mother, be unapologetic in my right to exist and be. Um, yeah, and I think that that, you know, is part of just kind of my core that impacts how, you know, I respond to to various situations. No, I think it's great. I mean, those are great. Those are great life lessons. I bet that little girl in uh, kindergarten never kicked or punched you again. <laughs> she did. She did them. not. She did not. Oh, yeah, it's yeah. a good life lesson there for her. Uh, <laughs> for her too. Uh, for her too. <laughs> Yeah, pick pick a fight with. Well, I love it. Well, I could keep talking to you all day, Marla, about all kinds of things. But um, for time, I will ask you this one final question. Um, you know, the legal profession can be incredibly rewarding. It sounds like it's been very rewarding for you in your career, but it also can be grueling <laughs> and relentless and unforgiving at times. And um, I, I, on a regular basis, talk to kind of junior associates who are trying to find their footing and they're trying to find their way in our profession and decide, you know, if this is right for them and if it is right for them, you know, exactly where do they fit. Um, what advice do you have to give to kind of newly minted attorneys who are trying to find their way in this profession of ours? So um, because the profession requires so much hard work, so much time, so much dedication, I think it's really important that each of us finds our lane in this profession that is a lane that we love, right? So there are, you know, so many options for careers as a lawyer. Um, there's, you know, government, there's other public service, there's law firms, there's small firms, there's medium firms, there's big firms, and then even within firms, there are different practice areas, right? Whether you want to be a transactional lawyer or a litigator. And I think it's really important to find a path where you really enjoy what you're doing because to work this hard and not enjoy it is a recipe for unhappiness. And so, you know, I, I, I started out thinking I wanted to be a, um, a plaintiff's lawyer doing like medical malpractice, representing individuals. I felt like I'd, you know, come to this profession to change people's lives. And I was going to, you know, one, one plaintiff at a time, you know, change the world. And what I realized is that I was not kind of intellectually satisfied by that and carrying the burden of um, and I, it, I very much admire people who do it, but for me, it, it carrying the burden of, you know, the, the tragedies that people experience in their lives turned out to be very difficult for me. And so I realized that being a plaintiff's lawyer was not the right path for me. And I ended up being a technology litigator, having no idea that I would absolutely love it. I am what, 27 years, 26, 27 years into this profession, still doing litigation for the vast majority of that time I've done technology litigation. And I still love it. I still, you know, love 
reviewing patents. I still love writing and editing briefs. And because of that, I think I've, you know, managed to stay in it for a long time and 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 do a decent job at it. So if a young lawyer is on a path that has them doing the type of work or a type of work that they don't enjoy, um, if if you're not finding yourself excited about something that you're working on in any given day, any given week, then find something else, right? You're young, you've got, you know, and and find something else before you get yourself, um, if you're in a law firm, for example, before you set yourself to a standard of living that it's now you're kind of stuck because you've bought this big house, for example, and, you know, you don't have a lot of flexibility, so so figure out what it is that you're going to enjoy doing for a long time and do it because then you're also going to be better at it because you enjoy doing it. You're going to think harder about it. You're going to think deeper, adapt, deeper about it and you're going to do a better job of it and you're going to be more successful at it. So find the path that um, also includes something you're passionate about. I think that's great advice. Well, um, Marla, thank you so much for giving me your time today and being so open and honest with uh, me and our listeners. I know that they will get a lot out of this conversation. I um, most assuredly did, and I sincerely appreciate your time. I am uh, was happy to do it, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you, Rebecca. Absolutely. Thank you for listening to Bouncing Back, resilience for lawyers. Join us next time for another story about thriving after overcoming challenges. You can find Bouncing Back and other programming for lawyers on MLA's Legal Talk Network.